Thank you, everyone. Um, if you can't hear me in the back at any point, let me know. I'm a bit soft-spoken. Um, thank you to the organizers for making this excellent session. Um, so this paper explores the consequences, both unintended and unintended, of, transfor of transforming um, sound into a static two-dimensional image. So first, I'm going to play you a little bit of the sound, that the transformation of the sound. That was the sound, and this is the image. So this is what an acoustic map, as I've created them, uh, looks like. So what you heard in that brief sound clip is a combination of audio recordings, a variety of sound producing artifacts created and played by the people from the Moche culture. The Moche culture, for those of you not familiar, flourished on the north coast of Peru from AD 100 to 850. This is a fixed two-dimensional acoustic map of the large Plaza One performance space at the Moche Urban Center of Huacas de Moche. So these are some of the uh, different types of instruments that were in that recording. So the acoustic map demonstrates the intensity of sound as it moves through space from a fixed source. The red spot on both the maps indicates um, where sound is heard the loudest, and the blue is where it becomes barely audible. So first I will outline the method of this transformation, and then I will discuss the implications of this conversion process, perhaps asking more questions than answering them. For instance, if one of the goals of a phenomenological or experiential approach to the past is to understand this past experience, can we ever truly achieve this understanding without upholding the primacy of the gaze? So this dramatic transformation or translation from sound into image illustrates Maurice Merleau-Ponty's process of creating knowledge. The core principles of Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology are that human beings experience the world with our entire bodies synesthetically, or with all our senses simultaneously. He explicitly writes how the separation of the senses is an artificial or cultural separation, not a separation inherent or intrinsic to the human body itself. Walter Ong elaborates on this idea, stating that, in great part, I, I quote, in great part, a given culture teaches you how to experience the world. Thus, it can be useful to think of cultures in terms of the organization of the sensorium, end quote. This process of organization of the sensorium is a mutually constitutive relationship between the human body and its surroundings. Yet, Merleau-Ponty muses that in order to analyze in the Western sense, an object, emotion, or experience, one must break up this holistic perception into separate qualities and sensations, which are then resynthesized to form understanding, analysis, and knowledge. It is this process of separation, analysis, and resynthesization that is explicitly demonstrated in the creation of an acoustic map. So despite the inseparability of the different senses such as hearing and vision, it remains useful for archaeological data collection to approach sound as a separate quantifiable entity. In the same way that archaeology has attempted to standardize descriptions of color and texture, sound already possesses a standardized vocabulary of measurement in the form of decibels for volume and frequencies for pitch. An acoustic map of an archaeological space visualizes the acoustic space created by a particular sound and environment and allows for the analysis of the interaction between the sound and space with the goal of quantifying what types of experiences each space actually affords. So the creation of an acoustic map requires the use of specialized testing equipment including an omnidirectional speaker, an amplifier, and sound level meters. An omnidirectional speaker, which is the round, round thing there, um, produces sound equally in all directions simultaneously. It emits pink noise, a type of noise that contains the entire range of frequencies that humans have the ability to hear and produces each frequency with equal intensity and power. 
This standardization of intensity across all frequencies creates the conditions under which any change in volume perceived or decibel level change recorded derives solely from environmental factors. The combination of the pink noise and omnidirectional speaker controls the variables of direction and intensity, allowing for the specific investigation of the interaction between sound and environment. So sound level meters, the middle one there, uh, measure sound levels in decibels, but decibel level does not necessarily correlate directly to human perceived loudness. That's something I'll go into a little later. So decibels instead allow for a standardization of sound intensity measurements across a space. So high frequency sounds, such as those produced by whistles, may have a lower decibel level, but a higher human perceived sound loudness. While low frequencies produced by drums or trumpets, for example, may have a higher decibel level and a lower perceived loudness. This is why decibel level meters have two calibrations to account for this difference, one for the high frequencies and one for the low frequencies, producing the two different types of maps. So the one on the left is the high frequency map, and the one on the right is the low frequency map. The longer wavelengths of low frequency sounds have more carrying power, and as they, as they are less influenced by diffraction, they are able to proceed around obstacles and fill space more completely. Thus, localization of the sound source is more difficult with low frequency sounds, and music stressing such sounds is more directionless in space, seeming to immerse the listener. So, to begin mapping, the speaker is assembled in the center of a space we wish to investigate. The sound level produced by the speaker was calibrated to between 95 and 100 decibels at a meter's distance. For this particular example from Waka's de Moche, decibel level data from over 400 examples of Moche sound producing artifacts indicate that the maximum decibel levels Moche instruments could produce generally fall between 95 and 100 decibels, or roughly the equivalent of modern orchestral instrumentation. Following the initial setup and calibration of the equipment, each surveyor or survey team walks an assigned transect across the site, stopping every 10 20 to 20 meters to record decibel levels, their own personal observations, and a GPS location. Once a surveyor finishes one path away from the speaker to the edge of hearing, they move to a different location until the entire site is recorded. So this information is then processed in GIS to produce an acoustic map of the area, including not only the breadth of sound, but its intensity across the space. So the large Moche urban center of Huacas de Moche sits at the fo foot of a lone mountain, Cerro Blanco, on the south bank of the Moche River, about five kilometers from the coast. It consists primarily of two adobe pyramids, Huaca del Sol and Huaca de la Luna, situated about 500 meters apart. In between these adobe pyramids lay a wide flat plain containing residential and craft production architecture referred to as the urban zone. Huaca de la Luna, the smaller of the two adobe pyramids, includes three large platforms situated on different levels linked by adjacent plazas of varying sizes. Plaza 1, seen here, the large main plaza, measures approximately 170 meters long by 75 meters wide, encompassing a space of over 12,000 square meters. This space is the potential to accommodate, thus, t depending on your calculation, between 6,000 and 12,000 people. Plaza 1 is enclosed by a wall and is accessed by only two small entrances, one on the northern side and another near the western corner. The southern side of Plaza 1 abuts the main Waka Pyramid and consists of at least seven tiered levels, which each tier displaying in polychrome painted low relief various larger-than-life repeated images of warriors, dancers, prisoners, and deities. A long, wide ramp connects the floor of the plaza to the top of the waka on the eastern side, and the southeast corner of the plaza contains a small room with an adjacent stage, the exteriors of which are elaborately decorated. So, oh, I can't use the thing. So here, this is the Waka de Luna complex, this is Waka del Sol, and this is part of the urban zone here, just for reference. So analysis of the acoustic maps reveals that high frequency sound, such as those produced by whistles and ocarinas, shown by the map on the left, was generally contained within Plaza 1 of Waka de Luna, except in select areas of the urban zone. Yet in contrast, the low frequency sound, such as produced by drums and trumpets, permeated the entire site. Additionally, for both high and low frequency sound, the main Waka de Luna structure was more sonically isolated from Plaza 1 than the urban zone itself. 
This map demonstrates that while the wall surrounding Plaza One obscured the visual spectacle occurring within, it did a very poor job of containing sound. In fact, more sound permeated the urban zone than reached the inner sanctum of the waka itself. This pattern creates different levels of participation between those inside and those outside the plaza. It also broadcasts the presence of a performance to the entire Wakas de Moche settlement, making the entire population consistently and constantly aware of these elite sponsored performances taking place within the plaza, while also emphasizing the link between sound and performance. So Walter Ong writes how sound is more real or existential than other senses, despite the fact that it is more ephemeral. So sound is intimately bound with present actuality, as it must emanate from a source here and now that is discernibly active. Thus, sound always signals the present use of power and remains inseparable from action. Sound creates presence. It signifies energy in life. Beyond its presence, sound situates the, le the listener in the center of an oral field. This is opposed to sight, which lays the world out in front of us. Sound situates us in the middle of the world, specifically in the middle of our present time. Thus, the, efficiency, the efficacy excuse me, and emotional impact of sound derives in part from its presence. And this presence arises from the use of energy in the present moment, which then dissipates rapidly across space and time. So the process of creating the acoustic map also fundamentally involves movement, both of sound and human bodies through a landscape. The mapping process involves experiencing this movement and sound energy, but actively and continuously translating this experience into numbers and words, <coughs> capturing that experience in a more permanent form, that of writing an image. For example, the first iteration of the map looks like this, dots representing individual decibel readings taken across the landscape. As you can see, the map intrinsically visualizes movement, however erratic, yeah, some of those lines aren't very uh, straight from my students. Um, <laughs> um, it visualizes movement of the individual surveyor or human body across the landscape. Yet the final map presents something utterly different. It presents a static view of sound as it travels across space, a smooth and continuous view a view seemingly frozen in time, though this image actually represents hours and even days of movement and energy as surveyors painstakingly transverse the landscape, recording information about monotonous and unpleasant sound. It also, in retrospect, can represent a very singular moment in time, the moment when a particular type of instrument is being played in that particular space. So this is the fundamental transformation from sound to image, it converts the ephemeral into the durable, the moving into the static. The ephemeral can only be experienced while the durable can be analyzed. Thus, subjectivity and objectivity possess differing temporalities. Objective data, such as the decibel level readings presented in the acoustic map, creates a fixed durable image of sound as it moves across both the built and natural landscape. In addition to removing sound from its temporality, the acoustic map presents sound in a way that no one human being could ever perceive and experience it at all places at the same time. This further removes the sound from its experiential impact. The map not only freezes and compresses time, but it compresses the experience of space as well. So Merleau-Ponty writes that while synesthetic perception is the rule, the senses are distinct from each other in so far as each one of them brings with it a structure of being which can never be exactly transposed. Instead, he writes that the senses intimately communicate with each other, translating each other without any need of an interpreter. It is the artificial separation of the senses for analysis that has created the category of the objective versus the more holistic subjective observation category. Decibel levels fall into the objective category, immediately reducing the emotional efficacy of sound to a nearly unintelligible number designating its volume. Yet the creation of the durable, objective image in the acoustic map also opens up an entirely different area of inquiry in knowledge production. The standardization of volume allows for comparison of different, different uh, specific differences created by the interaction of sound and space. And from this comparative data, we can attempt to extrapolate the types of relationships sound might afford within these spaces. Through the process of freezing and compressing space and time, the map allows for comparisons between different sounds, different spaces, different time periods and cultures. 
The transformation of lived ephemeral sound into fixed considered image allows for Merleau-Ponty's analysis and directs us towards resynthesis and eventual knowledge. While the acoustic map opens up these many avenues of inquiry, it permanently shuts many others. By divorcing sound from its fleeting temporality, the map image strips sound of much of its power, the power to move people emotionally, the power to affect memory and create community through shared experience. In one sense, this map presents synesthesia in action, combining sound and vision into one easily transportable, easily comparable, but albeit primarily visual object. In another, this creation is as far phenomenologically from sound as one could get. So does an acoustic map truly represent lived experience? Certainly not. In the same way that a plan view does not represent the lived experience of an archaeological site or architecture. The static image does not transmit the quality which makes sound the most efficacious, its presence. Its ability to move through space and time and through its movement elicit reactions and emotions from the listener. Yet the goal of creating an acoustic map is to allow archaeologists to access and to analyze past soundscapes in order to understand further past experiences and actions. It accomplishes this goal in the same fashion that the gaze always does, through exposure. Exposure meaning the revelation of new avenues of inquiry and ways to think about and access sound, both in the past and the present, but exposure also in the subjugation of sound to sight. The acoustic map exposes sound to surveillance and all that notion entails. So the map is supposed to prove that archaeologists can access sound in the past and accomplish this in an objective, rigorous way that can be replicated and compared. In that it per perhaps succeeds. Yet if the only way we can access sound in the past is through vision, through image, are we really any closer to the multi-sensory lived experience of past people, or are we simply extending the ways and forms through which we project our own image as opposed to other sensory ways of knowing into the past. Thank you.